Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We're glad that you're here this morning. If you're joining us online, and we welcome you as well. Things we want to update from our uh, bulletin. Uh, we want to give thanks and praise uh, for Linda Williams' friend, Teddy Davis. Uh, they had some tests done. Uh, Teddy did this week on uh, cancer. All the, the cancer is contained and has not spread, which is good news. Chemo will start this week, and so let's remember uh, Teddy and Pat Davis. Also, Jim Cook had his first uh, chemo treatment this week and uh, didn't respond as well as he wanted to, so he's back in the hospital, and uh, but he's feeling a little bit better yesterday, so let's continue to remember Jim and Gwen. Uh, we also got news on Friday that uh, Rita George's son, uh, Darrell, passed away, and so, uh, the George family certainly had lots of hardship uh, with the passing of Holton uh, and their other son this year, so let's remember uh, Rita and her family as well. Uh, it's good for us to come together and to be at the table of Jesus and to commune with his body and blood. It's quite a privilege to be able to do that, uh, that Jesus would dare invite us to his table. And uh, what a blessing that is for us to come together uh, and to remember his goodness. Uh, Mark Gray has our shepherd's prayer and Bryce Gage is going to lead our worship. Let's pray together. Father God, we come to you today humbled for the opportunity to be at your feet as we bow in prayer now. We thank you for this opportunity to gather together as a body of believers here in Marble Falls to worship you to give you praise, to seek your aid, just to be with you. We thank you for that opportunity. And Father, as we uh, come to our worship this morning, uh, we have both concerns and praises, well, some of them mentioned already. Uh, we, uh, we rejoice with Shelly's family as her niece is married over the weekend. Uh, we pray with Jim and Gwen and their family as Jim um, recovers from this first treatment and figures his plan forward. Father, we rejoice with the Davises, uh, even though their path forward has some treatment in it still. Uh, we rejoice that they did not find cancer anywhere else in his body. And Father, we ask that you be with Happy Fluid as he... Um, has his heart procedure, and that you be with his daughter-in-law, Stephanie, as she also is recovering. And Father, there are more, uh, more who need, and more who are celebrating. And we ask that you be with them as well. We thank you again for the rain that you've sent us. We thank you for the successful completion of graduation ceremony. We thank you for the future that you have planned for us as our seniors step into that future. Uh, lots of unknowns for them and for us. We can't wait to see all that you do through their lives, the way they will affect this world. And Father, again, we thank you for this time together. Help us to raise our heads, to look around, to see who's here and who's not here, to be encouragers, to be caretakers, and to love as you have loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. It is to me for you all saying. The Savior alone
Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for this time that we have to come together this week to, to worship together and to focus our hearts and minds on you. I pray that we would do that, um, and that this time would be uh, sacred and dedicated um, to attuning ourselves to you. We pray for those who can't be with us today, uh, be it for illness or circumstance, and we pray that you would put your hands around them and protect them and guide them uh, back to us soon. We thank you for Jesus, and we thank you for his life and the love uh, that he shared with the world, and we pray that we would be uh, reflections of that love to all the world as we go throughout our week. Be with us this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is love.
I'll be reading from Numbers 11, uh, verses 4 through 9. The rabble among them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Now the manna was like coriander seed, and its color was like the color of gum resin. The people went around and gathered it, ground it in the mills, or beat it in the mortars, then boiled it in pots and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was like the taste of cakes baked with oil. When the dew fell on the camp in the night, the manna would fall with it. Hey, wait, wait, I didn't say you could sit down. <laughs> now you can sit down. <laughs> you know, got you know, assert my authority here. <laughs> Whatever that means. So there's a phrase that has been uh, kicked around in our uh, new temporary offices. It has nothing directly to do with you as a church. Uh, It doesn't express any kind of great affection for one another in our close quarters. It's not spiritually forming in any way. Uh, It really doesn't speak to the well-being of the church, but it happens quite a bit, and it's expressed in a lot of different forms. Uh, Sometimes it's uh, anger, sarcasm, frustration, a sense of being defeated, and it usually starts with, hey, where is? And the phrase then goes to, oh, it must be in the storage building. So moves are hard, aren't they? Whether you're moving uh, across the country or across town or across the street, moves are hard. They take their toll on us emotionally and physically and spiritually. Nerves get a little frazzled in a move. Uh, You get a little edgy about things. And you can't find stuff, right? Somebody told me once uh, in my early part of my career, I thought it good to move around a lot as a preacher that, uh, you know, after two moves, it's about the same as a fire. You can't find anything, right? It's true. It's frustrating uh, sometimes to move, and it's, there's some anxiety and there's stress. And did I mention you can't find stuff? <laughs> moves are hard. So for 14 months... Israel had been very, I think, sedentary, or at least they had found some stability after leaving Egypt at the base of Mount Sinai. And as we looked at last week in Numbers 10, God said it's time to move. And the journey toward Canaan, that promise that was made back in Genesis 12 uh, to Abraham, it's time to go embrace that and and to fulfill that as God's chosen covenant people uh, to go embrace a gift that had been promised many, many, many years before. So things were looking pretty good. They had a good leader, a guy named Moses, who God called the most humble person on earth. And they had a good, Moses had a good right hand person in Joshua. Uh, the plan was good. God was leading. It was, you know, this pillar of cl- uh, cloud and fire. And uh, there was the Ark of the Covenant moving out. And things were good, right? I mean, what could go wrong with that? People. People. You know, I've come to, uh, to realize that In any organization or institution or family or congregation, if you got more than one, there's going to be a difference of opinion at some point, right? A 
church of one's not great, but it's, it's mostly conflict-free, unless you're like me with multiple personalities and then, you know, you're fighting yourself all the time. But what about two million people who are moving together? Yeah. Tough. Israel's on the move. And there's a, there's a group that, that starts chirping. Things aren't like they used to be. We were happy at Sinai. And maybe even, maybe even before. It's hard, right? Moves are hard. And the chirping is kind of general and, and God heard it and you know, it, it does spread like fire, and that's what God did. He spread a little fire on the edge of the camp uh, in Israel. And then there was another group that's called the, I call them the riffraff. That's what it, we're not sure who they are. Are they Israelites that didn't want to leave Egypt? Are they Egyptians that didn't want to stay in Egypt? Whoever, they're the chirpers. And you know how chirping starts kind of generally and things just aren't great? And then they got very specific. And Israel bought in. And all of a sudden, this great plan and this great adventure in which we're going to go fulfill what God's called us to do and who God's called us to be, it turns into a discussion about food. Food. Fish and cucumbers and garlic and onions and melons. What about some meat, God? We're carnivores here. Steak. No slide at all to you vegetarians and vegans. We want some meat, right? We want it like it was. I mean, all we got is manna. That's all we got. You know, manna, you can only do so much with manna, right? You got manna bread and manna pancakes and manna fritters and manna crepes and manna pudding, but after a while, you just got manna. Oh, you remember that fish? You minced that garlic, put the onion on top of it, bake it up, serve it with a side of cucumber and watermelon. Y'all remember that, right? Let's just go back to that. It was free. Let's just go back to that. That was better, right? It was better than manna. And it's better than moving with you people. Oh, yeah, there, there was slavery involved in that, wasn't there? I guess slavery is not as bad as not having a buffet. Isn't it amazing when things kind of get out of sort what we decide what we want and how what is immediate, an immediate craving or an immediate desire supersedes what is important? I mean, what's important here? That you get, right, some tilapia or that you get to fulfill what God's called you to be? What's important there? By the way, God heard all that. God was not amused at whining and complaining. He heard it a lot from this bunch. He was not amused. And what really strikes me about this passage in, in Numbers 11, it's we complain about what we don't have. Forget about what we have. Let's just complain about what we don't have or what we don't like. And let's see where that gets us. Now we'll stay in numbers. We're going to see where that gets us, if that's our posture. You know, fish and cucumbers and melons. I, I know, I know, we know, God. They were beating our backs, and we were making bricks with no straw, and we were oppressed. But, man, the food was good. It was good. We just got this stuff, right? Manna. I think that means what is it? Really, I think that's what it means. <laughs> it's all we got. It's all we got. Mm. The good old days. The way it used to be. 
the way that makes me comfortable. That's what I want, God. Give me fish and cucumbers and melons. I don't care what it costs. Just give me that because that's what I want. And I'm just going to sit here and complain about it until you do. You know, tackling God is a risky, risky venture, isn't it? Yep, it's not about what we have. It's about what we don't have. So you guys may remember some of you, and most of us have seen the movie or read about it. A little trip that happened in the 70s. It ended up being a seven-day trip. It was supposed to be longer. It got national attention. Because on day three, we heard this phrase that's stuck in most of our minds. Houston, we have a problem. Yep, Apollo 13 wasn't going to make it to the moon. Matter of fact, Apollo 13 wasn't going to make it home. And you know what they didn't have on Apollo 13? They didn't have fish or cucumbers or garlic or onions or melons. They didn't have that. You know what they had? They had plastic bags and cables and flashlights and manually winding wristwatches and pens and pencils and socks. And they had duct tape. And you know what? Not once, at least from what we have recorded, did those astronauts in that lunar module on Apollo 13 complain about what they didn't have. They didn't long for fish and cucumbers and melons and what was supposed to be they just said, this is what we got. We got manna and duct tape. You know what else they had? They had a crew in command center in Houston that had one mission in mind. Get them home. Let's figure out what we have and not what we don't. Because here's what we got and how can we use it to fulfill what we were called to do. Man, it is so easy, church, to long for fish and cucumbers and melons when God's given us duct tape and manna. Isn't it? And so I think about us as a church and as a body and as, as a people coming out of this pandemic, all those restrictions, all those rules, all those protocols, all the on and on and on and endless debates and discussion and division about who's right and who's wrong, and all the time yearning for what once was, right? Let's just get back to normal. There is no normal, church. This is normal, right? And as we're coming out of all those restrictions and all that mess, and it looks like things are going to go back to normal, uh, we have a building that we can't use except for a little bit, right? And I know, listen, it's frustrating, and we're hearing it. When, 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 Dan's tired of hearing when. It'll be when it will be, I can tell you that. And we're kind of longing for fish and cucumbers and melons again. And we forget that God's given us plenty of manna and duct tape. Isn't that right? We're here, aren't we? We're right. This is Sunday, right? Kind of lost track of days. We had two days of graduation and, you know, and we're here. And the table's here. We're here. That's some pretty good manna, isn't it? We got worship leaders who are passionate about leading us in worship. This is not a ho-hum thing for them. They believe that worshiping God matters. And they pour a lot into it. We got that. That's pretty good manna. 
And we got elders that care about you, that spend a lot of time every week in prayer for you and for me and for this church and for our world. That's not fish, but it's good manna. And we got a staff that tries to keep you informed about things that are going on in this church, try to keep you up to date. We got all this technology stuff, right? Uh, I think it's, it's what it's called. You know, we can send group texts and group emails. And we get to stream worship services, and classes, <laughs> and that's good manna. No, it's, it's, it's not like it used to be. And we don't have, you know, 20-something thousand square feet that we used to have to roam around downstairs. It's just not there right now. But you know what? We got what we have. And it's good. Right? It's good. And I guess we can complain about what we don't have and what we want, and we can chirp and whine about it. But maybe we ought to just praise God and thank God for duct tape and manna. Don't you? And what I pray, church, is that as a community, is we recognize that God is present and that God is at work and that God has provided what we need, not what we want always, not what we think we need immediately, but what's important. God has provided that. You know how much time Lisa and Aaron spend every week trying to make sure your kids get to see each other and get to learn about the love of God? It's phenomenal to watch them work. I'm exhausted by watching them. So that's, I'm just, I'm getting paid vicariously through their effort. I appreciate it so much. And, uh, it's incredible. It's incredible to watch how hard Rachel works to make sure you're up to date, to get it right. And phone calls she makes all day. Plus, she has to sit next to me all day long. And that's worth twice whatever we're paying her. Okay. I can't argue with that one three times then. Listen, and I'm, I, listen I'm, I, I, I whine a bunch about fish and cucumbers and melons and forget that God has given me great manna and duct tape. And what I pray, church, is that we would be like those people at Mission Control in Houston and Apollo 13 and have one mission in mind. Not whining about what we don't have or what we could have or how it used to be, but embracing what we're called to be, and that is the people of God who express and share the love of God with the world. Right? Now listen, I would take that over fish and cucumbers any day of the week. Give me that manna and give me that duct tape. Church, I pray we live into that. Hey, one day this building will be back to, well, I don't know if it'll be back to normal. It'll be back to where it was in some state. Okay. And we'll respond accordingly. But you know what? Right now, God has provided what we need. Right? And God's call is still the same. Go be my covenant people. Go be salt and light in the world. Share the good news of Jesus as you go along your way. Make disciples. Teach them about Jesus. Show them Jesus. Be Jesus. And that's good manna. That's good manna. That's pray. By the God, we come to you and ask for your forgiveness when we grumble and complain about what we don't have. May your spirit fill us with an attitude of praise and thanksgiving for what you've given us. For you've given us everything in Christ. And may we live into that. In Jesus' name, amen. Isn't it amazing that God knows what we need? In spite of what we say we want, God knows what we need. And when God looked at the history of humanity, what God recognized is what humanity needs 
is not a professor and not a great engineer and not a great orator. What humanity needs is a savior because we can't save ourselves from sin. And God gave us what we needed. Not what we wanted, but what we needed. He gave us a son to die and to take our sins away. Man, that is good. And that is plenty. Isn't it? And that's God's desire is that all people come to know Jesus and experience the salvation that Christ offers. And we want you to experience that too. To experience the manna from heaven named Jesus. To come and to confess him as the son of God. To die to yourself. To be buried with him in baptism. To be raised to walk in newness of life. And to have a new purpose in life and a new mission. And that is to live like Jesus. And we want to give you that opportunity this morning. So we're still in the wilderness some of us deeper than others, and we need people to walk alongside us. So we're here. And so elders are going to be at the back of the auditorium this morning. If there's a need that you have, please see one of them. Let's stand and sing.
I would like to share with you a story this morning. I was share a story with you about a man. I really don't hang on my nose very well. A man who was much like you and me in many regards. He was a good and honorable man, loved and respected by the people of this community. He was a he had served in the military for many years and was, had ranked, uh, reached high positions of authority. He was honored for his distinguished service. And he wanted to belong, but because of his certain characteristics, unacceptable differences, he never really did belong. Until one day, God appeared to him in a vision. His name was Cornelius. In that vision, God appears to him and he tells him that he wants him to go and see Peter. So he goes and sees Peter. Well, he doesn't go. He sends three people to go and visit Peter. And anyhow, as they are beginning to approach the house, Peter receives a vision. And in that vision, he's told by the Lord, he says, he saw the heaven open and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. And all in it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter replied, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unclean or, or is that un, unclean or profane. And the boy said to him again, a second time, and a third time, the same thing. And then the three men knocked on the gate, came to the gate, and Pete, God told Peter, he said, there's three men standing down at your gate. Get up and go down there and go with them. And he said, Cornelius, a God a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. And Peter gets up and he goes with the three men to visit our Corpone yeah, to Cornelius. And he comes to his house and he says, you yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or to visit a Gentile. That's how Cornelius was regarded. Though he was a well-respected, honorable person who was even loved and appreciated by the Jewish community because of what he did for them. Yet he was not one of them. And then, God, something miraculous appears while He's saying that. The Holy Spirit comes down and lands upon Cornelius and all of his entire household. And then for Peter understands what the way he perceived Cornelius in the past, that he was unclean. He could not partake, he could not participate with Cornelius because of who he was. He says, God clearly shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does not does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, <laughs> preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. And the reason I share that story with you this morning is because you and I mostly here, except, well, are all just like Cornelius. We weren't part of the nation of Israel. We weren't acceptable to the Jewish nation. We, you see, I want the story that Greg was sharing this morning about the experience that the Israelites went through. We tend to 
to establish our own identity based upon what transpires in our lives and it separates us from everybody else around us. And so the Lord had to appear to Peter. And this story was told over and over again in the early church because of how important that was for us to recognize who we are. We are part of the kingdom of God and we get to participate in the Lord's Supper this morning. And you know what? what I want to conclude with, I am thankful that I can participate that I can share communion with Bob Hader this morning, who is our Jewish believing Christian brother. And for all those who are of the Jewish faith who believe in Jesus Christ, we are all one now in Christ Jesus, and we participate in communion together with one another. Praise God. So let's close. Let's bow our heads right now in prayer. Thank you. Thank him for the, uh, the bread. Father, we are indeed a thankful people to be able to participate in this communion today with our Jewish brothers and sisters who believe in you. Thank you for ushering us in, to inviting us in to be part of your royal family. And we are such a blessed people. At this time, Father, we pray for your blessing upon this bread. And thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Father of heaven, we thank you so much for this fruit of the vine, which we know we participate in because of the blood of the Son, your Son, that was shed on the cross as a solemn reminder of who we are and what it costs to get us to where we are. Thank you again for allowing us to participate in this communion with you as your children. In his name we pray, amen. This time we also take the opportunity to express our appreciation to God for the blessings that we have through Him uh, and are able to continue to promote and encourage uh, the blessings with others by contributing what little, what, what we have to further the ministry here in Marble Falls and on mission points throughout the world in which we also support. And uh, we invite you to participate in this now as we come together in prayer. Father, thank you so much for the gift of life. Thank you so much for the gift of our possessions that you so bountifully pour upon us. Thank you for the manna and all the things in this life that you give to us to provide for us and uh, at this time we offer up to you this offering to be used in your faithful service in jesus name we pray amen <coughs>
beautiful morning it is. I was handed a little note before I got up here. Actually, a couple. Uh, William Holden, Phyllis Kincaid's grandson, had so shoulder surgery that did not heal, and he's re-injured it again. So uh, we need to keep him in our prayers. It's something we know about. Our son did the same thing, but but it's a it's a long road to hold for him. And also another note handed to me by our youth minister. You can tell he's our youth minister because he handed it to me in crayon this morning. <laughs> or maybe he just knows me. I need crayon. It says, youth, please have your parents sign the sign something. <laughs> back here in case of emergency oh, sign the in case of emergency forms they're in the foyer so let's remember that I guess I don't read crayon well anymore <laughs> oh by the way something special happened this morning Mary Albright showed up early and made coffee was that wonderful <laughs> man I just feel like things are all back. <clears throat> I'm going to read just a little bit here from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. And I'm going to jump to one matter under heaven here this morning in verse 4. And a time to laugh. We need to take time to laugh. What do they say about laughter? It's the best medicine. And I looked it up on the Mayo Clinic website, so all these doctors we have here can agree with me this morning. Coming straight from Dr. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> oh, laughter has great short-term effects stimulates many organs it enhances your oxygen intake stimulates your heart lungs and muscle and increases the endorphins that are released into your brain i have no idea what endorphins are i've never seen one but apparently they're really good for you it can soothe tension Okay, here we go. Laughter can also stimulate circulation and aid muscle relaxer, both of which can reduce the physical symptoms of stress. Long-term benefits, it can improve your immune system. Negative thoughts manifest into chemical reactions that can affect your body by, by bringing more stress into your system and decreasing your immunity. By contrast, positive thoughts can actually release neuropeptides that help fight stress and potentially more serious illness. I don't know what those are either, but apparently they're good for you. You can ask Curtis, he knows what those are. <laughs> Laughter can ease pain by causing the body to produce its own natural painkillers. That's why we laugh at people when they get hurt. <laughs> it's not that it's funny, we're trying to help. <laughs> I gotta revisit that one here. <laughs> oh, do you know some people don't have a sense of humor. You can train yourself to have a sense of humor. You can train yourself to laugh. Sometimes I have to make myself laugh because things aren't funny. Like some jokes I hear from certain people. <laughs> but if you start out doing that, it gets better. Did you know they even have laughing yoga? I've never heard of it, but they do. It's honest, it's on here. 
There are some things that aren't funny. Do not laugh at the expense of others. Sometimes we just got to discern when to laugh. My wife told me that we were, when we were on a boat out in the middle of the bay in a storm, waves coming up like this, motor's about to die, the ice coomers floating out the back of the boat, she explained to me that that was not the time to joke and be funny. <laughs> I thought if there was ever a time to joke and be funny, it was right then, because that was going to be it for us. But we do, we do need to laugh. Laughter is good for our soul. It's good for our spirit. It's good for us. It's good for those that are around us. You know, you look this morning at Greg's lesson. As they're navigating themselves through this wilderness, which we are too, aren't we? They were on their way to a land given to them, to live in homes not, that they didn't make. We're on our way to a home, to mansions that are built for us not by human hands. We're in that wilderness. Sometimes we need to laugh. We should have joy in our hearts because we know where we're going. Help us always to keep focus on where we're going. It's not here. We're going home. And sometimes laughter helps us get there. That's just my exhortation to you. Some of you young guys just graduating, laugh. It's good for you. Let's pray. God, we're so thankful for just, just a wonderful day. Uh, the beauty that you created for us. These blue skies that we have after the storms that came through. Father, we're grateful for it. Help us to look at the blessings in life that you give us. And as we look at the harsh times that come up, help us to remember that they're only for a little while that we are on our way home. Help us to keep joy in our heart, Father, and help us always to love you. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Now let's be standing for the closing